We aim to create a new leadership class for America, marked by courage, learning, friendship, patriotism, and vocational excellence. The desire to fight has got to come from a visceral love for your country, or else it will not seem worth any struggle against its corruption. What shall we do with this enormous inheritance, which is our birthright citizenship in history's greatest republic? On behalf of ISI students, alumni, and especially my friends Caleb and Luke, I want to thank you for benefiting conservative scholars. The three of us had the pleasure of meeting each other at the ISI Honors Program this summer in Philadelphia. And I cannot emphasize enough how deserving these men are of their awards. In just one week together, we took a conservative pilgrimage from the moral order of Jerusalem to the desks of our founding fathers. And that pilgrimage has not ended because the students beside me are not only thinkers, but doers. You can rest assured knowing that they are filling the void left by modern higher education. It's a gift to know them and to meet those tonight who make their efforts possible. I found ISI, or rather ISI found me, at my own place of education, the University of Dallas. There, I have befriended Dr. Susan Hansen, whom we honor tonight. Susan earned her undergraduate degree in history from Boston University, and then received her graduate degree in history from Rice University. I wish I could share even more about her professorship with the James Madison Fellowship at Georgetown, as well as her fellowship at the James Madison Program in American Ideals at Princeton. But Susan left the eastern seaboard for a dusty suburb of North Texas, and that's where I met her. Dr. Hansen is by far the most sought after professor on campus, and a naive student would expect to find her in her office on the second floor of Braniff Graduate Building, but she's never there. <laughs> One can find Susan where a true professor should be, but where few professors are these days. Students can find Susan on the lawn, instructing her class in view of the campus chapel. One can find her watching the Queen's funeral at 6 a.m. with students, a little shindig I hosted, reminiscing about her years in England. One can find her contemplating on the steps of Roman churches during a semester abroad. Again, one can find Susan where a true professor should be, but where few professors are. This is why she is worthy of being tonight's keynote speaker. She rev revives the forgotten art of teaching at a school that cultivates friendship more than any place I know. She has transformed the way I view history, and I'm happy to introduce her to you this evening. Friends, please give a warm welcome to the finest that higher education has to offer. And tonight's keynote, Dr. Susan Hansen. You're not going to get a Susan Hansen lecture tonight. Um, they usually run to an hour and 20 minutes, so. <laughs> in the middle of this life of ours, I awoke to find myself in a dark forest. And the direct path, the path forward, was utterly smeared out. Nel mezzo del cammino di nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura e la diritta via era smarita. I'm sure that many of you as conservatives tonight, today, in 2022, have that same feeling. That in the middle of this life of ours, we have awoken 
in the middle of a dark forest. Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura e la diritta via era smarita. At a difficult moment, at another difficult moment in our nation's history, during the secession winter of 1860 to 1861, Abraham Lincoln appealed to something deep in the soul. He appealed to America's patriotism. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. After four years of war and over 600,000 dead and the assassination of Lincoln himself, the American poet James Russell Lowell wrote that Lincoln had saved for us our country, had saved for us the beloved object of our patriotism. In his eulogy of Lincoln, he said, whatever the result of the convulsion whose first shocks were beginning to be felt, there would still be enough square miles for elbow room. But that ineffable sentiment made up of memory and hope, of instinct and tradition, which swells every man's heart and shapes his thought, though perhaps never present to his consciousness, would be gone from it, leaving it common earth and nothing more. Men might gather rich crops from it, but that ideal harvest of priceless associations would be reaped no longer. That fine virtue that sent up messages of courage and security would have evaporated beyond recall. We should be irrevocably cut off from our past and be forced to splice the ragged ends of our lives upon whatever new conditions chance might leave dangling for us. Lincoln describes patriotism as the mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land. We need to remind students of what a hearthstone is. And I always ask students to think about when they have a fireplace of their own, um, when they finally get out of the, the scudsy dorms where they're currently living, when they have a fireplace of their own and a mantelpiece of their own, what photos, family photos, religious photos, what busts of what American figures would they have on that mantelpiece? What memories do we have that connect our hearts and our hearthstones? James Russell Lowell describes patriotism as a virtue, as an ineffable sentiment made up of memory and hope, of instinct and tradition, which swells every man's heart and shapes his thought, though perhaps never present to his consciousness, a source of both courage and security, an attachment to the harvest of priceless associations that makes our land our home, rather than, I think it's a devastating phrase, common earth and nothing more. We are living through a crisis in which the cultural fabric of our nation, of our civilization, is being rent. For 50 years or more, we have sustained relentless attacks aimed at destroying the most fundamental bonds of society, the honor due to God, Father, and country. Since the 1960s and even earlier, teachers in our universities and schools have smoked anti-Americanism as the drug of choice in halls of academia. Hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. The campus chant has been repeated every year, every decade, with increased virulence at smaller and smaller holdout programs, or lone individual professors, devoted to passing on the Greco-Roman Judeo-Christian tradition that shaped the form of national identity that grew up on this soil. In 1953, when Russell Kirk first published his classic work, The Conservative Mind, and ISI was founded, Russell Kirk almost entitled the book The Conservative Route. That was three generations ago. If it hadn't been for Russell Kirk, The Conservative Mind, and the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, then the cultural scorched earth policy of the radical left might already have exterminated all patriotism in the hearts and minds of the young. In his 1974 classic, The Roots of the American Order, Russell Kirk worked a rich tapestry, showing how the threads of four great cultural heritage cities were woven into the fabric of American society, the moral, linguistic, cultural, religious, artistic, economic, and political heritage of Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, and London, created the rich civilizational soil from which American life grew. 
Russell Kirk understood that if Americans were going to sustain their national patriotism, they needed to deepen it into a capacious civilizational patriotism. 20 years ago, and I've only been teaching for 20 years, not 60 years. <laughs> uh, that's two zero, not six zero. Um, and I'm already exhausted, so I can't even imagine after 60 years. Um, 20 years ago, ISI gave me a Weaver Fellowship to help me finish my doctoral dissertation at Rice University. As one of the Weaver Fellows, I was invited to visit Russell Kirk's home in Macosta, Michigan, where we met Annette Kirk and spent a weekend exploring the multifaceted character of each of those four heritage cities. I was, at the time, writing about G.K. Chesterton's efforts to recover English national identity at the beginning of the 20th century, at the time of the two world wars. The dissertation was entitled, would be entitled, Discovering England. Under the accumulated layers of centuries of history, Chesterton worked to recover a sense of merry old England, of Englishness as a part of Christendom, a patriotism not for abstractions and universalist humanitarian slogans, but a genuine rootedness. I remember meeting the Chesterton scholar, Joseph Pierce, for the first time at a pub in Oxford and getting into a good old-fashioned heated argument. I was planning at the time to entitle my dissertation Inventing England. The idea of inventing national identities was all the intellectual fashion at the time, very postmodern thing to do, you know, inventing England, inventing Wales, inventing rights, inventing, everything was invented. Um, um, and so it's very, very postmodern. I was, I was going to call it Inventing England, um, Chesterton Inventing England. Chesterton had to excavate beneath the layers of the British Empire, Great Britain, the United Kingdom, to dig up the old hobbit-like physiognomy of English identity. But Joseph Pierce insisted that Chesterton invented nothing about the English, that the English really were like hobbits rooted in the soil and not deracinated moderns in business suits and top hats. Chesterton discovered England, he insisted. He didn't invent England. The English, Joseph Pierce insisted, were still there, still alive, not yet dead. Well, during World War II, the English proved themselves not yet dead. And in Brexit, much more recently, they've proved themselves not yet dead still. Uh, even though Roger Scruton has already written a beautiful elegy for England um, that I've been slowly reading for the past 10 years and thinking that he's even more depressed about England than I am um, about America. I remember thinking to myself at the time, talking to Joseph Pierce, with my thin visitor's view of the average London crowd on the tube, to each his own patriotism. I didn't see it. I couldn't see the Englanders he was talking about. Joseph Pierce is still patriotic for the hobbits of England, still believes in them, as I still believe in the average American. To each his own patriotism, I thought. For the past 20 years, I've been on my own voyage of discovery. There aren't many jobs for British historians. So I very quickly turned myself into an American historian in order to get a job. Teaching American civilization at the University of Dallas in the great state of Texas, the land of the free, during the academic year, and teaching Western civilization on the University of Dallas's splendid Rome campus during the summers, I have been free in a way that very few tenured academics are free these days, to excavate the layers of American national and religious identity. And every summer I was spurred on in my quest by participating in ISI's summer honors programs, which brought together faculty from around the country to present on the cultural inheritance America draws from Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, and London. Those summer honors programs brought together the lone conservative students from Ivy Leagues like Princeton, Harvard, and Yale, from big research universities like Stanford and the University of Chicago, and small countercultural religious liberal arts colleges like my own University of Dallas, Calvin College, Hillsdale, and Patrick Henry. In the utterly dried up, soul-destroying wasteland of higher education, which is absurd and putting it mildly, <laughs> ISI has sustained intellectually rich soil for deepening and sustaining American patriotism. This is the patriotism that our young people need. Ideologies prey on the deracinated. Ideologies prey on the uprooted and the rootless. 
Ideologies prey on those who have no roots in family, church, or nation. Conservatives must be patriots. It is not possible to be a conservative and to say that there is nothing valuable or worth preserving from your own national cultural tradition. The desire to fight for the integrity of your own country has got to come from a visceral love for your country or else it will not seem worth any struggle against its corruption. <sighs> 20 years ago, reflecting on how I had come to love England through reading Chesterton and Churchill, Jane Austen and P.G. Woodhouse, how I had become an Anglophile in my youthful reading habits, I came to a, re a realization that I had taken a wrong turn. And I wrote, the particular spirit of discovering home in, in, in Chesterton's thought runs counter to a striking phenomenon in American 20th century intellectual history, the expatriate life of so many American intellectuals. Chesterton has had very few followers in the 20th century who have rivaled his ability for cleansing and revitalizing their home culture through patriotic celebration. In Britain, George Orwell comes to mind. In America, Russell Kirk attempted something of the sort. But the tendency of Chesterton's fans has been to accept his diagnosis of English culture and ignore the method of cultural criticism through celebration, which is his more universal, more Catholic legacy. It is easier to adopt Chesterton's Merry England as a foreign land into which we escape and from which we observe our own culture with detachment and distaste. We become cosmopolitans traveling abroad in Chesterton land rather than true Chestertonians capable of discovering ourselves happy fools in our own homelands. On my first day at Oxford, my history tutor gave me a copy of George Orwell's England, Your England. I went and sat by the Thames to read it. It begins with the rather famous line, as I write, highly civilized human beings are flying overhead trying to kill me. Orwell had been an international socialist, but writing in 1940 in the midst of the Nazi bombing of London, he probed his innards to see if there was anything left of the patriotism muscle. Whether he could scrounge around in the ash heap of his psyche for the makings of love of country. This is what he found. When you come back to England from any foreign country, you have immediately the sensation of breathing different air. Even in the first few minutes, dozens of small things conspire to give you this feeling. The beer is bitterer, the coins are heavier, the grass is greener, the advertisements are more blatant. The crowds in the big towns with their knobby faces and bad teeth and gentle manners are different from a European crowd. Then the vastness of England swallows you up and you lose for a while your feeling that the whole nation has a single identifiable character. Are there really such things as nations? Are we not 46 million individuals, all different? And that I, the diversity of it, the chaos, the clatter of clogs and the Lancashire mill towns, the to and fro of the lorries on the Great North Road, the queues outside the labor exchanges, the rattle of pin tables in the Soho pubs, the old maids biking to Holy Communion through the mists of the autumn morning, all these are not only fragments, but characteristic fragments of the English scene. How can one make a pattern out of this muddle? But talk to foreigners, Orwell goes on, talk to foreigners, read foreign books or newspapers, and you are brought back to the same thought. Yes, there is something distinctive and recognizable in English civilization. It is a culture as individual as that of Spain. It is somehow bound up with solid breakfasts and gloomy Sundays, smoky towns and winding roads, green fields and red pillar boxes. It has a flavor of its own. Moreover, it is continuous. It stretches into the future and the past. There is something in it that persists, as in a living creature. What can the England of 1940 have in common with the England of 1840? But then, what have you in common with a child of five whose photograph your mother keeps on the mantelpiece? Nothing, except that you happen to be the same person. And above all, it is your civilization. It is you. However much you hate it or laugh at it, you will never be happy away from it for any length of time. The suet puddings and red pillar boxes have entered into your soul. Good or evil, it is yours. You belong to it, and this side of the grave, you will never get away from the marks it has given you. 
Even as an Anglophile student living in Oxford or as an Anglophile graduate student studying in the British Library in London, immersing myself in my favorite period, the dark days when Winston Churchill battled Mordor with nothing but hobbits and spitfires, no matter how charmed I was by English national identity and patriotism, it made me more than ever intrigued by American national identity and patriotism. Is American patriotism only an abstract patriotism for a political regime? Is it merely an allegiance to certain universal political ideals? Or has that regime shaped a particular kind of American soul? What do we think of the soul that has been shaped by our regime? What do we think of the people? Have those ideals not become embodied in particular Americans throughout our history? Is American patriotism incarnate, a fondness for language and landscape? George Orwell was able to point to fragments, what he called characteristic fragments, of English life. What are the characteristic fragments of American culture and history that every young American should be familiar with? Our young people live in a patriotic desert. They live in sci-fi and fantasy literature, in other worlds among creatures with other powers. They live in an online world abstracted from history, the world of Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. There was a time when the sound of music and Fiddler on the Roof told the story of America. When Americans understood that America had been a refuge for immigrants fleeing authoritarian, socialist, communist regimes in Germany, Russia, Cuba, and Vietnam, there was a time when Little House on the Prairie and Saving Private Ryan filled the imagination. Most of our students have never seen Saving Private Ryan. Most of them have never heard of Casablanca. <laughs> there was a time when the rugged virtues and work ethic of Ma and Pa carving out a homestead on the frontier and the courage of 20-year-olds under fire filled Americans with an honorable pride. There was a time when, were you there when they crucified my Lord by the rivers of Babylon and Old Lang Syne were our common musical heritage, when the fiddle met the banjo, and the heart-rending songs of slaves on southern plantations mingled with the Scots-Irish nostalgia for the old country. These are mere fragments, but they are characteristic fragments. I don't think in any way they are sufficient fragments. All of my brothers who looked over my speech told me that there's not enough American um, stories here and that you know I described English patriotism so well um, that I don't do as good a job with American. But I think that that's okay because I'm sure that all of you possess inside an inner store of such fragments. My fragments would be different from your fragments, but they would meet up in important ways. A store of fragments that we would wish to pass on to young people to give them a sense of a home worth living and fighting for. American culture is despised by our elites, but worse, American culture is utterly unknown to our young people. Without the priceless associations that James Russell Lowell referred to, without cultural memory and historical imagination, America would be common earth and nothing more. It might be worse than common earth and nothing more. It might just be a flash on a screen and nothing more. At least common earth right, um, still receives uh, our, the bodies of our dead. Um, and people do feel a patriotism to the land where their fathers died and where they're buried, um, or to the land where their children have died and their children are buried. We need many different units in the fight for American culture. We desperately need the valiant news sources that warn us daily, hourly, of the signs of destruction all around us, the radicalization of the Department of Justice and the targeting of patriotic Americans, the lunacy of our quote-unquote medical health professions under the craze of transgenderism, the steady drumbeat of cancel culture against anyone who speaks the blandest common sense like Jordan Peterson. But we also rather desperately need groups like ISI, who are trying to pass on to the next generation the traditions that continue to inspire patriotism for the vital remnants of American culture. 
that re remain worth defending. We need institutions committed to instilling in young people a capacious national American patriotism rooted in a love for the Judeo-Christian Greco-Roman tradition. Without patriotism, the young will have no will to fight. Their hearts will not bleed at the sight of the moral and political corruption if they know nothing of America's greatness. ISI has labored to help young people recover their lost heritage and put flesh on the bones of their moral and political principles. I don't know if you know Poland's national anthem. I come from Polish Chicago and from a long line of Polish Chicago. <laughs> um, and I've been to Poland a number of times um, as a John Paul II groupie, um, traveling around, you know, following him wherever he went. Um, and there's a wonderful old Cold War spy novel called um, While Still We Live, which is by Helen McGuinness, which is a quotation from the opening line of Poland's national anthem, which is, Poland is not yet dead, while still we live. Whenever I am with the young people involved in ISI's movement, I remember the words of Poland's national anthem and think, my country is not yet dead, while still we live. Thank you.